Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's Fall 2019 webinar series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Osborne, and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar, which is Update on Emerald Ash Borer Biocontrol, and it's going to be presented by Julie Gould. Julie works for the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which is APHIS, and as an entomologist and focuses on biocontrol measures for invasive pests such as emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, spotted lanternfly, and Rosso king scale. We welcome your questions and comments today. Please type them in the Q&A feature or the chat pod, and we will respond to them after the webinar presentation. We welcome your questions and comments today. Tomorrow you will receive a link to a short voluntary confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us to bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include Julie's contact information as well as information on how to obtain the CEUs for viewing the live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today. And Julie, I'm going to unmute you and you are free to start your presentation. Thanks, Robin. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, so I've been working on biocontrol of emerald ash borers since about the very beginning in about 2003. And I'm going to present all the work uh, very briefly that we have um, accomplished over the last 15 years or so. And I'm going to give a little history of EAB and some context of biocontrol for those people who um, are less familiar with it and then I will talk about biocontrol itself and how we are bringing it to bear on the emerald ash borer. Um, EAB was discovered near um, Detroit, Michigan in 2002 and it is thought that it was introduced into North America in via the pathway of solid wood packing material at least 10 years before it was found um, and identified as EAB. Um, and EAB, I'm going to tell you a little bit about its life cycle because this will have important implications for some of the discussions I have about our implementation of biocontrol later on. But a typical life cycle of a bucrusted beetle, including the emerald ash borer, is that the adults emerge in the spring. They then have a period of feeding and maturation. They then mate. Um, and after that, after, after a couple of weeks after emerging, the female begins to lay eggs and EAB females lay their eggs in cracks um, underneath the bark. Um, these are a picture of some eggs and the eggs are very flattened because the bark has been peeled off of them. The larvae then begin feeding and the larvae feed between the bark and the hardwood. They feed in the phloem and cambium area. Um, then, and this is an important point. If enough heat units have been uh, accumulated over the summer and the EAB larva is mature, it will then chew an overwintering chamber in the wood. It will become what we call a J larva and it will overwinter as such. In some places in the north, it's not warm enough for all of the uh, larvae to form to reach this overwintering stage and they overwinter as larvae. And that actually has very important implications for biocontrol. Um, the following spring, if um, the EAB that have overwintered as J larvae become pupae and the adults emerge, that's a one year life cycle, and then rinse and repeat, they do it all over again. Um, so the damage 
produced by the emerald ash borer is produced by the larval stage. The adults feed on the leaves, but it's not very damaging. The larvae um, produce galleries underneath the bark as they feed. And the galleries are serpentine in shape. And eventually they will girdle and kill branches. Then, you know, the EAB starts in the top of the trees, branches start to die. EAB then moves further down the tree and eventually the entire tree is killed. And hundreds of millions of ash trees have already died in the United States and the economic and environmental costs are, are quite considerable. Um, there certainly are economic impacts, I mean, excuse me, ecological impacts. Even though ash is only about 2% of our trees in this country, where it exists, it's often very, very important. You can see that at this bend in the river, it's a riparian area. This was a lot of ash and the uh, forest has been changed dramatically after all of these ash trees have died. There are also a lot of economic impacts. After Dutch elm disease swept the nation, a lot of those, Dutch, of those elm trees were replaced by ash. And as you can see from this photo, um, these trees are going to have to be dealt with, they're going to have to be removed, and the whole um, character of this neighborhood is going to be vastly different once these ash trees are gone. Ash is also important for making baseball bats and um, bucket handles and lots of other very useful items. Um, and there are also um, cultural um, uses for ash. Native peoples um, use black ash bark to make these beautiful baskets. And it's not only economic for them, but also very cultural. So, um, you know, the, the big picture is about 2% of our leaf area is ash. It's estimated it costs at least $30 million a year just to manage, um, to manage this pest. 50 to 60 billion in ash related economic losses and 282 billion in timberland. So quite an impact from this um, little insect. And back in the early um, 2000s when we found this, um, people were scrambling to try to contain it, um, keep it from spreading, even to eradicate it. And the initial strategy the big one was mechanical control. If a tree that contained emerald ash borer was found, it was cut down, brought to these marshalling yards and chipped up um, to very small pieces to kill the EAB inside. Um, and, and another big push was regulatory. Um, quarantines were put in place. Um, lots of education, don't move firewood. Um, you know, don't move any products containing ash out of areas known to contain EAB. And chemical uh, control was also um, tried. And there are some very effective chemicals uh, for treating EAB. The problem is they're not cost effective on a very large area. So initial strategies, try to, to contain it. But the problem is EAB has a very large potential for spread. The adults are very strong flyers, but natural spread isn't the thing, it's artificial spread. Infested nursery stock was a big one early on. There was a grower in Michigan who ignored the quarantine regulations, shipped um, infested ash trees to Maryland. and All of a sudden we had a huge outbreak in Maryland that was never contained. Um, infested firewood. Um, when I was first working on this, if I wanted to find EAB, I would just go to a campground and look around. And sure enough, there, there would um, be EAB. And infested logs. So EAB had a huge potential to spread. And since we have found EAB in 2002, EAB is now in 35 states and five provinces in Canada. It's all over the place. It's probably even in Mississippi, even though that they haven't found it yet. Um, it's typically five to seven years um, that EAB has been in an area before humans are actually able to, um, to find it. So eradication did not happen. Emerald ash borer continued to advance, um, killing ash trees in its wake. And so 
<clears throat> actually very early on, uh, there were people who said, hmm, I don't think this is gonna be eradicated. Let's try a long-term strategy. And that strategy was classical biological control. And I'd like to introduce you to that. It's something I've worked on for my entire career. And that is the importation of specialist natural enemies for the sustained control of an introduced pest from a foreign uh, location. And the benefits of classical biocontrol, one of the big ones is it can be very specific. Many in, insects are living inside of another insect, these parasitic insects that we're using. And, the, and the, there's an arms race going on, an evolutionary arms race. And so because of that, it can be very specific that some of these um, parasitic wasps will only kill and attack one single species or one genera. So it can be very specific, it can be self-sustaining. These um, parasitic insects reproduce in their hosts and they reproduce again, they go find new hosts, they reproduce and they, and they spread out. Very, it can be very cost effective in the long run if it works, and it can be very, very effective, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, there are, of course, risks and disadvantages of anything. Um, one of the biggest uh, concerns that we always have is possible non-target effects. Is, are these um, insects that we're releasing to control one pest going to attack something that's native to the United States? And we always do testing to make sure that won't happen. Uh, possible negative impacts on humans. Um, the multicolored Asian lady beetle, which was released uh, against aphids in the Midwest, uh, it overwinters in people's houses in absolute groves, and there are some people that are allergic to these and are having severe health issues because of that. So we have to be concerned about that. Um, another problem is it's not easy or quick to implement. It takes time to do biocontrol, and it takes some expertise. Um, and it never will completely eliminate the pest. And upfront costs can be considerable. You have to invest um, upfront. So because of these disadvantages, you have to make sure from the outset that there's a high probability of success before you um, pursue developing biocontrol. So the very first bio classical biocontrol project in the United States was in California. There was an insect called the Cottony Cushion Scale that was introduced in the late 1800s, and it almost devastated the California citrus industry. Um, this beautiful beetle called the Vidalia beetle and a parasitic wasp were brought in from overseas and they were introduced and they literally saved the industry. Um, and the, the cottony cushion scale is not a pest to this day. Um, this started um, an, an absolute avalanche of other um, biocontrol projects worldwide. And since that time in the late 1800s, there have been over 5,000 introductions um, against arthropods uh, um, throughout the world. One of the very successful projects was the cassava mealybug. Um, cassava is not native, is native to South America, but it's grown extensively in Africa, where for some people it makes up 70% of the calories they ingest in a day. And in 1970, the cassava mealybug was introduced and caused up to 80% crop loss, which was just devastating to the people who relied on cassava. Um, scientists found this host-specific parasitoid in South America and brought it to Africa. It was hugely successful. And they estimate the benefit cost ratio was a 500 to one. And of course, these benefits keep accruing over time. Um, this is a project near and dear to my heart, also on ash. This was my very first uh, biocontrol project back when I was a postdoc in Riverside, California. And I worked on ash whitefly, which was introduced to California in the 1980s. And it was a pest of fruit trees and shade trees as well as ash. And you can see those leaves, they're covered with honeydew and um, sooty mold. Um, and that's from the honeydew produced by um, these white flies, and the white fly population just exploded. 
But in its native range, no one had ever really written about this white fly because it was just not a pest. Nobody cared. And so um, scientists went to the home range of the ash white fly and found this beautiful little wasp and introduced it. And ash white fly is just simply not a, not a pest anymore. This uh, wasp is keeping it in check still 25 years later. Um, so overall, um, about 16% of uh, classical biocontrol projects are completely successful, like ash whitefly and cassava mealybug. 42% are partially provide partial control, you know, in some circumstances, but not others. Some projects failed because they were too limited in duration and resources. Uh, the um, you have you have to put in the cost. The costs are up front. You have to put in the resources in order to succeed. Um, in Australia, they did a study, and the average cost-benefit ratio of a biocontrol project was 10.6 to 1, compared with 2.5 to 1 for pesticides. So um, biocontrol, when it works, is very um, can be very cost-effective. And overall, is the benefits from successful projects outweigh the combined costs of all the unsuccessful projects. So when do we use classical biocontrol and did that apply to emerald ash borer? We use classical biocontrol when the species is not native, when it's been established for at least five years, check, um, when it's causing economic or ecological damage, check for EAB, and when eradication is not possible. So um, these were all true for emerald ash borer and so scientists decided um, very early on in the project in 2003 that we would pursue um, classical biocontrol of EAB. And this lists the steps that are involved in all classical biocontrol projects and we followed all of these for EAB. You have to study the invasive pest, you have to find out where its weaknesses are and what its life cycle is. You need to survey for native natural enemies. There might be something in, um, in the invaded range that's killing them. And in fact, in our country, that is woodpeckers. Um, they do do a lot of damage and contribute to mortality. Um, then comes foreign exploration for natural enemies. You have to then select potential biocontrol agents. As I mentioned, you don't wanna use all of them. You have to make sure they have a good likelihood of, of um, doing some good. You then import these biocontrol agents into quarantine and conduct host specificity testing. Um, then comes a lot of paperwork. You have to produce all these release justification documents to show that you're not going to um, do any harm if these insect, insects are released. You then request and receive permits. Uh, you then have to find field sites, mass rear all the insects, release them. And then you have to find out if you're doing any good and study the impact on both the target and non-target. So as you can see, this is a lot of work and has involved a lot of scientists from many agencies over the years. Um, so step number one was to look for na native natural enemies that might be attacking EAB. And other than woodpeckers that I mentioned, there were very few parasitoids, less than 1% parasitism of EAB in Michigan um, in the early years. Um, foreign exploration then was the next step. And at first we concentrated in China. Uh, we looked at five different provinces plus the municipalities of Beijing and Tianjin. And number two, which is Jilin province, uh, we found two parasitoids there and number six, which is Tianjin, it's a municipality. We found two parasitoids there. I'm gonna introduce you to these parasitoids now. Um, this is Petrasticus planiponesi, it's a eulophid. Um, it's relatively tiny, and the reason is, is that it's what we call gregarious. It lays multiple eggs inside of the EAB. And if you look at the top center, um, slot um, photograph, which is an EAB, you will see that there are little tiny uh, white things swimming around inside of the EAB. Those are actually the larvae of Tetrasticus. And so this is an internal parasitoid. 
it's gregarious. And if you look at the next photograph, this is an emerald ash borer larva just packed full of mature tetrastichus larvae. These larvae then explode out of the EAB, kind of like aliens, and they then pupate in the EAB gallery, emerge as adults, and repeat the cycle. So for each EAB, you get 50 to 100 of these tetrastichus being produced, and they have more than one generation a year, like three to four generations a year. So they really can have quite an impact on you. Um, this is um, an insect we found in Tianjin, China. It's Bathius agrilli. It's also gregarious. Um, you can see that this female, you can see her ovipositor. She's drilled it right down through the bark of the tree because they have to find those larvae under the bark. And that's how they do it. They drill their ovipositor down. But this is an external parasitoid. It lays its eggs on the outside of the EAB. Uh, the larvae then again consume the entire lar EAB larva and they have, um, they produce cocoons inside of the EAB gallery and again two to three generations per year. So another very promising natural enemy. Um, this is Oensertus agrilli. It's a very, very tiny wasp and it attacks the EAB eggs and the EAB eggs are only a millimeter in size. Um, the photograph on the top shows what the larva looks like when it's removed from the EAB egg, and then the um, photo on the right shows the pupa. And then the bottom is a parasitized EAB egg. The egg has turned black because that's what happens when it's parasitized, and you can see the little hole from which the adult um, emerged. Again, multi-generational Oobius has two generations per year. Another parasitoid that we found in Tianjin was called Sclerodermis puperii. However, parasitism levels were relatively low. Um, a high proportion of the females were wingless, which meant that they wouldn't, weren't going to go very far. They wouldn't fly and they weren't going to be very good dispersers. And members of this genus have been known to sting people, which would not make us very popular. So, we decided that this was not an appropriate biocontrol agent and we never imported this species or considered it for release. Um, so as I mentioned, we looked at, we needed evidence of host specificity. Um, and we did a lot of testing in quarantine, both in our country and in China. And what we found is, is that the parasitoids we were testing attacked significantly more EAB than non-targets to both choice and no choice, choice test in the laboratory. Spathius agrilli, we did some olfactometer work and found it was attracted to ash leaves, not to leaves of other plants. Neither of the two larval parasitoids were reared from any other um, beetles in the same genus as EAB in China. And Spathius and Tetrasticus in this country were not switching over in any great numbers to EAB. So they weren't, you know, switching and finding new hosts. So we took all this evidence and, um, and the, presented the need for some control of EAB and lots and lots of paperwork. Um, we had to meet requirements of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we had to write an environmental assessment, which was then posted for public comment. But eventually in 2007, uh, permits were issued and we were able to begin release of parasitoids. So we could release them, but then we had to mass rear large numbers of these things. And you can all imagine how difficult that is because the emerald ash borer is living under the bark of a tree. How do you rear parasitoids? You know, you obviously have to rear the EAB as well, and it's very, it's um, hard to get at. So this is the method we came up with. What we do is we go out in the field and cut down logs containing EAB pupae which we then put in cardboard tubes and emerge them. You can see on the, on, in that little jar, you have emerging EAB adults. We then rear these adults on ash foliage, which during the winter we actually get shipped in from Hawaii. There's a 
kind of ash tree called an evergreen ash. And we actually have the leaves shipped to our rearing facility from Hawaii during the winter. Um, we then, um, the emerald ash borers, you can see on that lid on the right, all those little dots are emerald ash borer eggs. The emerald ash borers get their ovipositor under that screening and they like to lay their eggs on the coffee filter. If we need um, EAB larvae, what we then do is put those eggs on cut ash logs, which are kept wet at the bottom. And these EAB eggs hatch and the larvae develop normally in the logs. We then take either the papers with eggs on them and present them to a lobbyist, or we take the ash logs containing larvae and present them to um, the Tetrasticus and Spathius, and that is how we get reproduction in the lab. And because we developed these new methods of rearing, we also were able to revise our release methods. We used to aspirate adults and open up the lid and the adults would fly and who knows where they went. But now we can release all these insects as pupae. We put um, these, this little pill bottle contains pupae of Oobius agrilli, and we just take the logs that have reared the larval parasitoids and we simply hang these logs out in the field. So um, we've really streamlined how we've been able to rear and release these natural enemies. And these are the numbers that we've released. And you can see that in 2015, we almost reared a million Tetrasticus, which is just really phenomenal if you think about it. Um, and the reason there was a decline in rearing numbers from 2015 to 16 is because you, if you take an EAB egg and turn it into a larva, you can rear 50 to 100 Tetrasticus. But if you take that egg and give it to Oobius, you can only rear one Oobius. So that's why there was a decline in Tetrasticus because we made a concerted effort to rear more Oobius that year. Um, so, so far we've released parasitoids in 25 of the 35 infested states. Um, you can see Colorado out in the west. Um, we've released up in Minnesota in the north, Louisiana in the south, and up to Vermont in, um, in the east. So we've been releasing all over the country. Um, so the next step, of course, is to find out are they establishing and are the parasitoids doing any good? So we have several methods of sampling. You can debark the tree. Um, that's how you find the larvae. That's fairly time consuming. Um, we have a bark scraping method where we get um, bark debris and we tediously go through it and look for EAB eggs to see if they're parasitized. You can put logs or bark in tubes and the a, emerging adults will collect themselves. And we've also developed some yellow pan traps, which um, are very cheap and easy to put out. And we've been using them quite a lot in our surveys throughout the country. So what have we found? Well, we have found that Tetrasticus planipanese has so far been recovered from 16 states. <clears throat> Oobius, which is, as you can imagine, a lot harder to find because it's so tiny, uh, that's been recovered in 11 states. And both of these species are persisting and dispersing. In fact, Tetrasticus, we once found it nine kilometers from the nearest release site in one year. It really is getting around and, um, and establishing in lots and lots of places. Um, Spathius agrilli, on the other hand, it has been recovered. Um, we release it, we find it the next year, so it, it overwinters okay, but it's not establishing. It then just disappears. Uh, so that was somewhat disappointing. And one of the things that we found, we started looking it more into why was Spathius agrilli not establishing in the northern US. And one indication was, is that climate matching shows that where we found it in Tianjin, China, is climatically more similar to the central and southern US than it is to the north where we had been releasing it. And based on that data, the EAB Biocontrol Program decided to conserve its resources and only release Spathius agrilli south of the 40th parallel. 
But there's a problem. Petrasticus, with all its great establishment and movement, it has a really short ovipositor. And research has shown it's restricted to attacking EAB in small diameter branch ash trunks and branches. So that's problematic. We needed something with a long ovipositor. And fortunately, foreign exploration was continuing, and we found Spathius galeni which is of this beautiful insect who you can see this is, um, this insect is again ovipositing on EAB through the bark. It has a very long ovipositor and it's from Vladivostok, Russia. And climate matching shows that Vladivostok is more similar to the Northern US, just where we needed it. So that was very good news. So we went through, again, we had to go through the whole host specificity process found out it was quite species specific. Um, the release petition got unanimous support and we got permits and began releasing in 2015. And it has been recovered in Connecticut, Massachusetts and New York. And I should have also added, since I made this slide, we have also discovered it in, New York, in um, Illinois and Colorado. So, we're very pleased and very hopeful that this will continue to, to do well. So what is up with the phenology of EAB and its parasitoids? You know, why was Spathius agrilli not establishing in the north? Would it establish in the south? We, we did some specific studies in Tennessee and New York to look at this question. And we also looked at the phenology, the life cycle of EAB. And what we found is, is that in the south, in Tennessee, most of the EAB are exhibiting that one-year life cycle I was talking about. So the majority of them are overwintering as day larvae. So when Tetrasticus emerges in the spring, there are no larvae for it to parasitize. Whereas in New York, EAB populations are overwintering in all sorts of larval stages. Um, so we would then hypothesize that Spathius agrilini and Tetrasticus would only be appropriate for release and establishment in the north. Um, Spathius agrilli has a very different life cycle. It actually doesn't emerge in the spring. It doesn't emerge until around July or so. And by then, EAB has developed to the larval stage that it needs, and so, um, and also in the north, we found that Spathius agrilli has a dead end fall generation. It has a generation that comes out, and there's nothing for it to attack, and it dies out. So um, we expect that Spathius galeni and Tetrasticus will be important in the north, and Spathius agrilli important in the south. Um, one big study that we did was we said, well, where are, you know, what is the proportion of EAB that are overwintering as larvae throughout the country. And you can see from this map that our 40th parallel was not a bad guess. <laughs> Above it, um, more than 50% of the EAB are overwintering as larvae, whereas below it, um, fewer than 50% are. Um, the, the red stars indicate where we've recovered to Crasticus. But the thing is, below the, the 40th parallel, those red stars are simply single finds. They're not sustained populations. So we're still developing this, this um, and still doing research on this issue, uh, but we think this is going to be very helpful. And what it's based on is degree, growing degree days. Um, so if, if if you have, if in the summer, by the, by the end of September, if your location has accumulated fewer than 3,000 growing degree days, you probably should not be releasing to trash. So we, we're continuing to develop this as a tool to help people know whether or not they should be releasing to trash in, at their sites. So, um, so the big question that everybody always asks is, well, so what? You've got these parasites out there. Will they actually affect the population growth of emerald ash borer? So um, we have conducted studies, long-term studies, at the very early sites where we started releasing in Michigan. 
Um, the parasitoids were introduced from 2007 to 2010. Um, you can see the, uh, the areas on the map of Michigan. It's in central Michigan where we were doing this work. And this is what happened to EAB density. Now, keep in mind, this isn't densities on a per acre basis. This is density per live phloem of ash. So there still were live ash trees at the end of all this. And even though the live ash trees were there, the density of EAB had declined. So in 2009, EAB peaked. It then, um, it then started to go down, and it has remained below 10 EAB per meter squared um, ever since then. Um, one of the big mortality factors, as I mentioned before, was woodpeckers. But woodpecker predation is pretty constant at around 40%. But the nice thing is that it's still around 40%, even though EAB densities have declined dramatically. Um, but also look at what happened with parasitism by Tetrasticus planopinesi. Over this time, we've had an increase in parasitism. So now parasitism is between 20 and 30%. And you add on to that the 40% woodpeckers, and you, you're upwards of 70, 80%. Um, mortality of the EAB. Um, so in the scientists who conducted this study concluded that the EAB density peaked in 2009 but declined fivefold by 2014. And there was one thing I didn't mention, there was a lot of parasitism by a native parasitoid that hadn't been picked up in our early studies uh, called Atanacolis. So but this parasitism was partly responsible for this EAB reduction. Tetrastic planopinesi is now the dominant parasitoid. And, um, and we're still gonna have to look at what's going on with Oobius because it's really, it's really tiny and it's hard to find out. But um, we were very pleased uh, with what was happening um, in, in some of our early sites. And so Spathius Galini, has only been released since 2015, but we're beginning to see some pretty astonishing results from Spathius Galini. These were some sites in New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. And you can see that parasitism by Spathius has in, in just four years since, you know, since the release has really skyrocketed. Um, and so we're continuing to follow those populations um, with great hope that uh, Spathius Galini will also add to the picture and, um, and as well as to Trasticus. Um, so one of, the, one of the evolutions of the biocontrol projects thinking though is that we are probably not going to save the big ash trees. Um, we simply cannot rear and release enough parasitoids to, to kill all of the millions of emerald ash borer that are out there. And even though we release parasitoids, the big trees do die, which is very sad. But, um, but we are focusing on the next generation of ash because we do think, and, and we've seen time and again, that as the populations of EAB come down, parasitism is quite high. Um, and even in these stands like you see here with lots of dead ash, they're small saplings and they're seedlings of ash. And so we've been conducting studies both in Michigan and New York to find out what is going on in these younger trees. And it's looking good. Um, these young trees, even though these are all saplings, um, the, the, and they're big enough to be attacked by EAB. EAB can attack a tree down to one inch, very small. So even though these trees could be attacked by EAB, if you look at the light blue, those are trees with absolutely no EAB in them at all. Um, and <clears throat> this was even after, you know, all of thousands of EAB coming out of the big trees surrounding these small ones. Um, and 17% of these trees, that's the dark blue, had old galleries, but no new ones. So the tree had recovered and there were no new EAB. So only 18% of these saplings had any live EAB in them. 
And so what was killing the EAB in these trees? <clears throat> what this graph shows is the mortality of EAB in saplings in New York. And, and the graph on the right, which says HRV, that's uh, Hudson River Valley, and Randolph is in the western part of New York. And one interesting thing is, is it, we have four bars in each graph. Each one is the different instars, instars one, two, three, and four. And one thing you'll notice is the bright green. Bright green, it says KBT, that means killed by tree. So even though our ashes in the United States are not as nearly as resistant to EAB as the trees in Asia are, they still do kill some of the EAB. There's still quite a bit of this green killed by tree. Um, the other thing to notice is the fourth instar. And there's a lot of mortality, both in the Hudson River Valley and in Randolph. And in Randolph especially, look at the fourth instar bar. That's the bar on the very far right. Not a single living emerald ash borer. We sampled 20 trees from six sites. So we were sampling 120 trees. And we did not see a single living emerald ash borer. Most of them were killed by tetrasticus or woodpeckers. So in this next generation of ash, and this is, this is what happened in New York in my studies, very similar situation in Michigan. Lots of um, mortality of EAB in the, in the next generation of ash. So that's very promising. Um, so the one final topic I'm gonna touch upon is something I alluded to, and that was the fact that we can't save those big trees. They are dying in the forest, but in urban areas, people are treating their trees with systemic insecticides because they like their trees and, and they provide shade. And so I asked the question, can these systemic insecticides keep these live ash trees alive while the parasitoid, parasitoid populations are building up and establishing and increasing? And will the suppression of the EAB population allow those parasites to increase more quickly relative to their host? And, can, and eventually, can we stop using the insecticides because the biocontrol agents are established and can cause sufficient mortality? So why might this work? Well, Tetrasticus and Oobius have shown that they're really good at building up and dispersing. Insecticides can be really effective at keeping ash trees alive, even when there's high EAB uh, density and lots of pressure. And EAB populations reach a peak and decline at the same time that parasitism by native parasitoids, Thrasticus and Oobius, are building up. Um, and woodpeckers are um, really good at continuing to remove um, mature EAB larvae, even as the EAB density declines. So we thought this might work and set up um, studies in Syracuse, New York, Naperville, Illinois, and um, Boulder, Colorado. And so far, things are looking really good. Um, the map on the right shows what happened in Syracuse, New York. Um, the yellow dots are where we ended up releasing the parasitoids, and the top circle is our release plot, and the bottom circle is our control plot where we had no releases. And Within the very first year, if you look at the light blue dots, within the very first year, we found Tetrasticus two kilometers from the release site. And uh, you can see on the graph on the right, um, you know, we found less than 10 Tetrasticus the first year. But every year thereafter, we found more and more Tetrasticus. And by 2017, they were spread all throughout the control plot. And they remain so in 2018. Um, and this is happening in all three cities. We're getting good buildup and movement. Um, Spathius galeni, it wasn't released, of course, until later, but it's also establishing and spreading. Oobius agrile has only been recovered so far in Colorado. Um, but so we're not, these, this, the data I showed you here was from yellow pan traps, but we also collected branch samples where we looked density of EAB and the percent parasitism. And what we found was that EAB densities are way down, even in untreated trees. Parasitism is way up. Woodpeckers are doing their job. 
And so in 2019, we are actually discontinuing treatments um, in our insecticide treated trees uh, to see what happens going forward, if they can survive and persist uh, without, um, without further need for insecticide treatments. So in summary then, um, I would say that our results are promising. Uh, Tetrasicus and Oobius are establishing well and dispersing up north. Uh, we're continuing to release Spathius agrilli in the south and to study it there. And Spathius bellini looks promising in the north as well for helping control EAB in big trees. Um, EAB in young ash trees are suffering high mortality from woodpeckers and Tetrasicus. And, um, Tetrasicus and Spathius galeni are spreading well in urban areas, and we think that they might be able to contribute to an integrated pest management program against this pest. So that is all I have for today, and I welcome your questions. Well, thank you, Julie. Appreciate this uh, very much. You've really updated us uh, uh, quite a bit. We do get a lot of questions about biocontrol. So I, I'm glad you were able and available and willing to um, give us the update. We do, I have one question here. What happens when all these natural enemies succeed in doing the job and eradicate all the EAB in the US? What is the alternative host for these natural enemies and what impact will it have when they start attacking alternative hosts? Well, I'm sorry that you didn't, uh, that I was not sufficient, sufficiently clear with my host specificity testing. They do not attack other things. That was the whole idea with the host specificity testing that we did. We tested two-line chestnut borer, we tested bronze birch borer, we tested raspberry cane borer, we tested lots of native species, and they simply don't attack them. And so first of all, no biocontrol agent ever has eradicated anything. Um, there, you, you simply reduce it. Um, and Tetrasicus planipanisi is amazing at finding EAB. As I said, we found it nine kilometers away. We have a study that we did in New York where EAB was moving along a linear corridor and literally Tetrasicus was on its tail. And we also would have individual ash trees out in the middle of farm fields. EAB were in them, Prasticus found them. So what's going to happen is, is that the situation here is hopefully going to become what the situation's like in China. In China, um, you have very low densities of EAB and the parasites find them and the parasites persist. And um, so it will become an equilibrium with parasites and, and EAB, just we hope at very low density. Um, but number one, EAB will not be eradicated. And number two, we do not believe that they will go to other hosts because we've tested it and they do not um, attack them. Um, so um, anyway. Okay. Um, do you think that Tetrasticus might be the best candidate for control in Oregon? Yeah. Um, well, we would have to go back to that map um, <laughs> that I that I showed. Um, I mean, I I don't think that any one candidate is better or worse than others. Um, I mean, I think they all play a role. And uh, I'm going to go back to my map because I haven't ever looked at what happened. So in Oregon, based on the degree days, Tetrasticus would be a fabulous candidate, but as would Spathius Bellini. Again, you need both of them because uh, Tetrasticus can attack EAB in smaller trees, but you need something with a long ovipositor like Spathius Bellini. But I think they would both very uh, appropriate in Oregon. Okay. Um, following a cold winter in 2018 and 2019, what were the impacts of cold winter temps on the parasitoids? That is an excellent question. Um, I would say that we don't fully know that yet. Um, 
we we had an experience. I, I think it depends on how cold it gets because I think they call them polar vortex or something. We had that happen in Syracuse, New York, where we were doing our phenology work. And what happened was is that the um, the EAB was severely impacted in that many, many of them of the EAB themselves died from the cold. But the slide I showed that showed our collections of um, parasitoids of Tetrasticus, that was all going on during that time. And the parasitoids did not seem to be impacted. So, so at that in that year, under those circumstances, the EAB seemed affected, but not the parasitoid. However, I have heard rumors of, I believe it was Minnesota, and the fact that there were, there were issues with the parasitoids also succumbing to the cold. So that is a really important question that research needs to address. All right. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. Um, hi, Julie, you mentioned that woodpeckers combined with parasitic wasps will have a high impact on EAB. However, won't woodpeckers also have an impact on the parasitic wasp populations? Also, are there any of these species present in Ontario, Canada? Um, Ontario, Canada has been releasing Tetrasticus, I believe. Um, the that's that's really interesting because um so we have actually observed woodpeckers that have gone in to galleries containing parasitoids and if there's spathius in there they seem to go black and do nothing <laughs> um and if there's a if there's a eab parasitized by tetrasticus if the tetrasticus are still inside the EAB larva, the woodpecker can pull the EAB out and eat it. And yes, that would indeed kill the tetrasticus inside. However, once the tetrasticus have, and the tetrasticus are only probably inside the EAB for about a week, and once they burst forth, uh, from the from the EAB, the woodpeckers cannot get them out. We've seen many instances where the woodpeckers have gone into a gallery containing lots of Tetrasticus larvae, and they don't remove them. We the larvae are still in there. Um, I think that how the woodpeckers do it is they go in and they grab the EAB and pull it out, kind of like spaghetti, and they can't do that with parasitoids. Um, so yes, there will be some impact of woodpeckers on the parasitoids, but it will be limited to only those parasitoids still inside the EAB. Okay. Um, how much do you expect parasitoids will increase percent survival of small ash trees and large ash trees after that initial peak and decline of EAB? Well, that's why we're funding Dan Cashin at Wayne State University is to answer that question. And we don't have the answer to that yet. I'm okay. sorry to say, but we, we're on, we're on it. <laughs> All right. Um, I have two questions here um, from one person. You mentioned there was parasitism happening prior to the natural biocontrol you helped implement. I'm wondering why that parasite wasn't considered after it was discovered during your studies and number two, to well, let me let me answer that one first. <laughs> um, so that was a Tanacolis um, species that were native, and the problem with that species is that it only seems to um, be effective at very high EAB density. Um, it's sporadic. We don't always see it. In fact, we we've only seen it really having this effect in Michigan. We did not see it happening in New York. And it only, we only saw high levels of parasitism when we'd already reached densities of 45 to 60 EAB larvae per meter squared. What, we, what you need to have an effective long-term biocontrol strategy is a parasite like Tetrasticus that's really good at finding EAB 
at low densities. Um, so, um, and, and for that matter, Atanacolis is everywhere. I mean, it's, al it's already everywhere. And if it were going to have a population level effect, it should be having it. There's no way we can use any of these parasitoids in an augmentative manner. Um, so, so what, what's the next question? The next question is, will the ash tree population in the U.S. recover, or will we lose such a substantial amount that it will be another elm situation? Well, um, I can't, we can't answer that yet. Um, but as I said, because we seem to be saving the young trees, and we're going to continue to follow them, and the hope, I have, I have been quite amazed. You know, I've been to in Boulder, Colorado, where we've released these parasitoids, and, and even in southern Michigan, there are ash trees coming back, and they're relatively big, and they grow fast. And I really do hope that the parasitoids can continue to control EAB, but it's, it's way too early to know. I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, these are these are decade-long processes that I will probably be retired before we know the answer to. Um, but I'm very hopeful because I, I recently took a cross-country trip where I drove to Colorado, down to Texas, back through Arkansas. Everywhere I went, there was dead ash. It was as if they were mocking me, you know, to <laughs> to uh, to do a better job. So um, it, it's a devastating problem, and I really do hope that. Um, these parasitoids can, can help us on the next generation of ash. I understand that because being here in Michigan, driving up and down some of the uh, interstate highways, and it's like you can't not see the ash trees. It's kind of become an obsession. You just can't not see them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Um, what are the plans for parasite release in heavily infested states like Ohio? Well, um, we are, we are actually, um, Melissa Ferkey, who's with um, State University of New York, is doing a study right now, which we're calling an aftermath study, which is releasing these parasitoids into sites which have had no parasite releases before, but are, you know, they're only the next generation of that. And so we are encouraging people to go ahead and release parasites. You know, if, if you have many saplings and you have EAB in them, we're, we're encouraging people to go ahead and release the parasitoids on those trees. Um, and we're also encouraging people in the northern states like Ohio, Michigan, where where Spathius agrilli did not establish. We're encouraging people to get Galeni in there, even though if the releases have been done, let's get this new species in there. Um, APHIS's goal is to make sure that the parasites are released in every single county that's infested with EAB. And um, we're, APHIS is doing a real push to try to get more cooperators on board, people who want to do the releases for us. It was it was kind of interesting because we thought that our limiting factor would be the number of parasitoids that we could rear. And that turned out that was not the case. The limiting factor was the number of people willing to go put them out. So, um, so we're, we're, we're really pursuing that. Um, so the goal is release in every county in the country that's infested with the AB, which unfortunately, of course, keeps growing every year. Thank you. Um, this question says, my question is very specific regarding site selection for releasing parasitoids. I know preferred site characteristics are about 25% ash composition and less than 40 acres of forest. Would EAB biological control methods still be appropriate for an area that is about two to three acres and about 25% ash composition? It would certainly not be ideal. Um, the, the answer would be, are there corridors? Are there connections to other, you, you know, if, if that's, if that particular two to three acre site was next to a big ash swamp, the answer would be yes. You know, it's, it's, it's somewhat site specific. Um, 
because you know we want they as we said and and also they would need to look and see if there is the next generation of ash on those couple of acres um you know are there seedlings and saplings something else coming on um and i i don't make decisions about what's the you know i i give advice to the program on what's the site and it's up to the program to decide based on many factors, considering their availability of parasitoids and are there other sites nearby and you know, are there connections to other ash stands? You know, what what's a good site? Okay, um, kind of the same kind of question. This, um, um, there's a question about where do we get the parasitoids? The parasitoids are, um, are gotten <laughs> from the, um, uh, there's a biocontrol rearing facility in Brighton, Michigan, and they are the clearinghouse for deciding, you know, who gets parasitoids. Um, I know that they, there are, um, there are issues, you know, with, with, um, needing to make sure that when you're going to do releases that it's done on a site that's going to be around for a while um you know one that's maybe remote or you know doesn't pose hazards to humans so the trees need to be cut down the sites need to be around for the parasites to establish and prosper and move out um we we were dealing with some um property owners the, the woman was great. We had done several years of important research and she decided to give her property to her daughter who was a lawyer who kicked us out of there so fast, you know. So, uh, so we often tend to try to work on um, government property, state land, federal land, um, you know, something where we're not gonna, you know, be subject to the whims of, um, you know, property owners changing their minds. Um, but again, um, it's very it's very specific um, to the situation, and you need to contact the biocontrol rearing facility in Brighton, Michigan, um, regarding sites that you think are appropriate. All right. Um, is there any data or publications on this yet? Ah, tons. <laughs> yes. Um, Mostly look up Gian Duan. He's he's the most prolific publisher. That's D U A N. If you search for papers by him, um, lots of he has lots of publications on this. Heidi, um, you're getting a lot of comments um, thanking you for all um, all the great uh, information that you have sent or have offered here. So, a lot of people are appreciating this presentation. So thanks so much again. Um, oh, you're quite, you're all quite welcome. Uh, let's see, uh, I have one here that says, aside from woodpeckers, what other creatures prey upon these parasitoids and what impact will this have on them? Will the populations of these predators increase due to increase of succulent parasitoids? Um, that's a really good question. And I have never seen, um, I have never seen any evidence of dead parasitoids or um, I, we've never found a predaceous insect inside a gallery with the parasitoids and we've killed a lot of trees. Um, that is a very interesting question. I mean, um, there are clarid beetles that are working under the bark. I think some of them have been known to eat a couple of VAB. Um, that's a really interesting question, but honestly, we have never seen anything. And I, I think we would have, given how many um, trees we've, we've peeled. It's, it's pretty hard to get in there. They're pretty secluded under there, under the bark. But very interesting. All right, thank you. Um, this, another person has said this was so informative. Thank you very much. Lots to consider from an urban forestry perspective. So, um, I'm yeah, more. I'm really hoping that this IPM in urban areas works because I think it has a lot of potential. And in fact, um, I'm taking this back to this concept back to the forests. Um, as I mentioned, um, the black ash baskets are really important to the native peoples. And 
black ash is highly susceptible to EAB. And so I'm actually starting to work in black ash forests where we will use this concept to treat the big, important reproductive ash, black ash trees in the ash forests and release the parasites and see if we can't um, do the same thing in, in the forest that we've done in the urban areas. Good luck with that. That sounds great. I, I know that there's been a lot of concern with the black ash basket makers about this. So um, I think we are out of questions for now, Julie. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to let everybody remind everybody that we are recording this and it will be available on the Emerald Ash Borer um, University webpage on the emeraldashborer.info site. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop the recording.